Welcome to this episode of Corona Peace Theater. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's been a while since we've named, we've done a, a whatever peace theater joke. Yeah. Well, it just seemed appropriate. I think Corona Peace works. Try to think if I've heard any good news today. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Spoiler Peace Theater, the podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers. We just want to talk about the movies. My name is Evan Cree, and I'm editor for The Independent. I am co-chair of BAFCA and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. I'm Dave Riedel. I write for Salt Lake City Weekly, and I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. Hi, I'm Megan Kearns. I'm a freelance writer and film critic, editor of Bitch Flicks, and I, too, am a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. And we are recording remotely uh, for the foreseeable future. <laughs> yeah. I think we all know why, but in case you are listening to this at a different date in, in history and you're not aware, the coronavirus, this uh, pandemic is currently in progress and we are socially distancing ourselves so that we don't infect each other. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we're, we're <laughs> it's kind of a weird time to like be reviewing movies, but... We are going to focus for, I would say, the foreseeable future on streaming titles. So either things that are available on, you know, one of the big streaming networks, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, uh, or things that you might be able to, you know, get on demand or some combination of those items. Uh, So based on that, we're going to be talking about two movies this week. We're going to be talking about Lost Girls, which is available on Netflix. Is it a sequel to Lost Boys? Unfortunately, is not. (laughs) Though I would love that sequel. Um. (laughs) And then I did hear that they're working on a Lost Boys TV show. Oh, I hope it's true. With gender swapping, I think. Yeah, I've heard that too. There's something something interesting. Uh, At first, I was like, no, and then I heard. Then I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm on board. I'll watch that. Uh, And the other film we're going to be talking about is Blow the Man Down, which I think we all saw. We did. Yeah. Yay. Okay, so then I suppose we should probably start with Lost Girls. That sounds like a plan. Cool. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so this is available on Netflix. This is a Netflix original, I believe. And um, where do we start? It's based on a true story, from what I understand. Mm-hmm. Yep, it is a true is, story. I think that's probably ultimately what makes it so goddamn frustrating watching it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it's just... It is police incompetence at its p- pinnacle. <laughs> um, over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, based on a true story, uh, here's the Netflix summary. When Marie Gilbert's daughter disappears, police in action drives her own investigation into the gated Long Island community where Shannon, her daughter, was last seen. Her search brings attention to over a dozen murdered sex workers. <laughs> what? Yes. A dozen? So, yeah. Yes. So this is based on a true story from what I understand. Yep, the Long it's Island unsolved, Killer. Yeah. Yeah, it's an unsolved uh, series of murders. And uh, yeah, so Amy Ryan plays uh, Marie Gilbert and her daughter. Shannon was, uh, was a, a sex worker and she goes missing and... You know, she's a she's able to trace her last known whereabouts to this gated community in Long Island where her daughter frantically called 911 and then disappeared. And so, like, they, you know, they have a recording of her, you know, frantically trying to get help and they don't know what happened. And like, yeah. So who else is in this? Dean Winters everyone's favorite mayhem uh, <laughs> oh, yeah with like a shitty mustache plays like one of the detectives that works on the case and gabriel byrne mm-hmm. plays the police commissioner who is working on this case uh amy ryan's in it lola and then kirk. thomason yes lola kirk uh plays a sister of one of the other victims right yes and then thomason mckenzie plays one of uh amy ryan's other daughters she has two other daughters um 
Yeah. So where where to start with this? It's infuriating, first of all. I mean, like, you just, you see uh, Amy Ryan's character following up in all these ways on the murder that the police, or the disappearance that the police just totally did not. You know, just like basic things you think that they would check. Like, there is a security cam that points over the direction where her daughter was last seen and no one bothered to check the footage or even ask for it. There's just like basic breakdowns of what you think would be good police procedure. Uh, And you're just like, what the fuck? What's wrong with these people? Like they're lazy, they're incompetent. And also they just don't give a fuck because it's a sex worker. And it's just like, it's so apparent. And I feel like that's what's so uh, frustrating, you know, just kind of watching Amy Ryan do all this like really great investigative work to try and figure out what the hell happened to her daughter. Meanwhile, she keeps, you know, trying to either show them evidence or do something and they're just totally dragging their feet and just fucking around. Yeah. Amy Ryan is so, I mean, I, I've been a huge Amy Ryan fan for a really long time since probably since I saw her on the wire, if not even earlier, but I love her in this so much. This is such a complicated role in a really awful situation in a film. And she just brings so much depth to this role. And she just fully embodies this character, this really, this incredibly angry woman. And so often we don't Mm -hmm. get to see really angry women on screen. And when we do, they're treated as being hysterical or unhinged or villainous or something to that effect. And what I love about Liz Garbus's film is that she completely centers the film on Mary's anger and on her outrage over her daughter being discarded and how she's continuously, Mm -hmm. you know, dismissed. And she, you know, she says, I will not be silenced. And she says that repeatedly throughout this. And, One of my favorite scenes, actually, it is my favorite scene, is when she meets all of the other family members at a restaurant and she's talking about, like, they're talking kind of about, like, oh, well, isn't it great? Like, you know, now finally the police are paying attention to their deaths and, you know, the news is covering it. And she's like, have you been watching the news? Like, all they're doing is focusing on the men and the cops and, you know, and they're talking about, you know, are girls like they're, you know, just like they're hookers and they're prostitutes and they're sex workers, but they're not actually talking about them like they're people. And they're not talking about them like they're, you know, sisters and daughters. And it's just, it's such, it's such a powerful moment. And it, in another film, it might feel like, oh, you know, this is, this is the moment, this is the moment where, you know, the, the film's ramping up, it's giving its like, you know, award winning, you know, speech, but Amy Ryan does it with so much emotion and oh I just I I love what she brings to this role and 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 to that Mm -hmm. moment and it it is so frustrating to see her continuously being thwarted and just coming up against obstacle after obstacle after obstacle and how the police just completely don't give a shit about her don't give a shit about her daughter or these or these girls because they absolutely are considered disposable because they're sex workers Mm -hmm. And that's a great scene that you're talking about, Megan. And one of the things that I love about it is that she reminds everybody the entire reason that this happened is a complete fucking accident. Mm -hmm. So like a cop pulls over to let his his, you know, dog out of the car to go to the bathroom and the dog finds this grave with the three or four bodies in it. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they even find out about the murders in the first place. And then like over the course of a year, they keep finding more body parts in various different places. And, you know, they realize that like this serial killer has been killing people for like 15 years or something like that and scattering their bodies everywhere. And the police just go out of their way to try and distance shannon uh, amy ryan's daughter from this situation say like oh we don't think it's related she isn't it's not the same mo fucking bullshit it is it's like it is exactly Mm -hmm. it's the same fucking thing they're all sex workers that are killed and they're all in this area and it's just it's so ridiculous the way they try to like play it off like it's just not a a thing and it like it gets to the point where she she has to demand essentially that they search this area this like thicket and so they have to like 
plow it and drain it or do whatever to get in there. Like, it's a real big fucking operation. And then they, of course, find her daughter's body in there. Honestly, one of the most gruesome things I've seen in a, in a movie, too, because... Like, they talk about one of the identifying marks of her daughter is that she has, like, a plate in her jaw from when her boyfriend beat her up. And so, like, there's a part later after they, like, dug the body. They found the body and then, like, Thomas and Mackenzie and Amy Ryan, like, walk over and see, like, the rotted skeleton in the ground with, like, the plate, you know, sticking out of its jaw. And it's just, like, ooh, just totally gruesome. <laughs> it's horrible that she has to look at that and see that it's like i couldn't believe they didn't move the body yeah it's it's frustrating in a lot of ways it is a good story uh like in terms of like drama like there's good drama there's good performances although i'm there's some questionable accent going on with thomas and mckenzie (laughs) who i normally like yeah but i feel like what the hell accent is she using in this movie because it's fucking weird i mean Uh, a lot of people get you know New York accents wrong, Boston accents wrong, so I'm kind of not surprised, but it is it is strange. I yeah. I would have almost rather she just spoke in her normal voice. Mm-hmm. I say normal, yeah. like yeah, like whatever her like regular speaking voice is. Like I'm assuming her speaking voice and leave no trace is her speaking voice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was really, I'm always happy to see Kevin Corrigan plays a supporting role and I'm always happy when he shows up because I, I think he's underrated as a supporting player and he's kind of like this concerned neighbor conspiracy theorist guy who, Mm -hmm. who, uh, um, teams up with Amy Ryan to help her investigate this guy who's in the area, who's got like a limp and he's a doctor and he supposedly runs this home for wayward girls or some bullshit like that. Like he called, this, this is the twisted thing. He calls Amy Ryan like the morning that the daughter was missing going like, oh, I, you know, your daughter was here and I like helped her. Sure you did. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's pretty much the prime suspect, but like it, there doesn't seem to be any real evidence to like be able to pin him on even though it's like literally outside his door where her body was found well that's the interesting (laughs) thing too speaking of that is because you know so so um you know amy ryan playing mary lives in this you know lives in a poorer community a working class community and she's got a you know she works two jobs she works construction and she works uh, in a bar and um you know shannon her daughter was you know sending home money you know, doing sex work. And then Shannon was, you know, last seen in a gated community. And that's part of the reason why the cops are so reticent to explore and investigate. And because of this, you know, private community, and it really is, you know, juxtaposition of, you know, wealth disparity and how that not only impacts, obviously, daily life, but it it impacts, you know, the justice system too, and who is deemed worthy and who is deemed as having, you know, humanity enough where we're going to care and investigate and where we're not. And we're going to, you know, push that aside, you know, if you're not considered someone worthwhile enough to care about and to, you know, investigate what's happening. And so it's, it's, it's an interesting class commentary happening too. Oh, for sure. And that that's another great point, Megan. You just reminded me that. Um, so one of the things, Dave, is that the daughter called 911 and it took an hour for the police to show up. What? And so Amy Ryan goes there with like a news crew and the other, you know, the other family members of women who are murdered to like do like a vigil or some kind of protest, basically. And within like minutes, the cops show up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of She's course. Like. You've got to be fucking kidding me. Someone, some lady here was like yelling at her porch at me, calls the cops and you guys come here, you know, lickety split. And like, in the, I think she says in less time in it than it takes to make a sandwich. <laughs> she does. And it took, <laughs> it took, you know, it took you an hour to get here for my daughter. And then by the way, this is also, this is like kind of like a funny line even though it's not a funny situation is that like while they're walking around, they find one of her daughter's earrings and they're like, here you go. Here's fucking evidence. You idiot. Mm -hmm. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's fucking heartbreaking too, because like, I feel like this guts you in the title cards too. At the end, it's like you find out that Marie Gilbert, uh, 
So there's there's an element of the plot having to do with the fact that her daughter was bipolar. And that was why originally when she was young, she had to give up her daughter to the foster care system because she just she couldn't manage with working and, and having two other daughters. And so there's that element to it. But you find out in the title cards that one of her other daughters also had mental illness. And like there was some situation where like her daughter stabbed her and she died. So like, Oh my God. Died. Yeah. And this case is still unsolved. And it's just like, they just hit you like in the title card, just freaking gut you. <laughs> yeah. One of the interesting things, I mean, <laughs> interesting, one of the kind of awful things, but also interesting things about, um, about this, that the film, since the film came out or not since the film came out, but since it was in production, um, somewhat recently, um, I guess the Suffolk County Police Department came forward and um, said they had like a new development on the case or something like that. And it was like their first like press conference on the case in like a long time. But uh, yeah, Liz Garbus was talking about that in an interview she did um, where she was talking about like how after Mary died, like it was so heartbreaking because like she had talked to her on the phone um, about production of the film and then she died like, you know, a few weeks later. And yeah, so... I guess on the bright side, at least there is a break in the case. But yeah, the whole thing is just depressing and awful and horrifying. It's good, but it's rough. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm also I was really interested, too, um, because even though it's a true story, it's still a narrative film. And and Liz Garbus has done a ton of documentary work. And this was her first narrative film. And I was really curious, since this is based on a true story, why she chose to do this. And she was in this interview that I read, um, I think it was with Decider. She was saying that when you do, obviously when you do, um, documentary work, you're, you're editing and you're choosing what to keep in and and what to leave out. And she always, she says she's always guided by a central core truth. And she said that she found that in this story too. And when she was doing this film, she stuck to that and she was really struck by, how Mary is continuously silenced and how it it speaks to a larger story of how women are never believed. And it just, I mean, as a woman, obviously I know this and I, you know, experience this, but it's still just so gut wrenching and heartbreaking to see it play out on screen and to see all of the different issues of mental illness and, um, you know, you know, class issues and and the police failing and just all of these things just failing her and her not having any support it's just awful yeah i think i feel like that's all that i have to say (laughs) did you have anything (laughs) else you want to add about lost girls uh um the one thing i will say is and i know i already talked about amy ryan and her amazing because she is amazing performance but i really love i always love seeing complicated women on screen and i love seeing complicated mothers on screen too and i just i Mm -hmm. i love seeing this character that she's you know she's not a perfect mother she's you know made choices that she thought were best at the time but maybe you know other people would not consider to be the quote right choice and I just I love that she's a fully developed character. I mean, yes, she's based on a real person, of course, but she also is a very fully developed character in this film. And I just I love seeing complicated women. And I love that we get to see, you know, her. And like I said, I love that she's full of rage and she's, you know, she's unapologetic about it. And she's talking to another another one of the mothers. And she's like, you know, when when does this anger stop? And she's like, it only stops when you stop blaming yourself. And there's another point in the film where Gabriel Byrne says to her something like, it's not your fault, which I think is interesting coming from him. But he says that to her and she's like, or he's like, it's not on Mm -hmm. you. And she's like, I'm the mother. It's all on me. And it is so, it is really interesting to think about that because, you know, the pressures that, you know, parents face, but especially the pressures that, that mothers, that society puts on mothers, like how they have to be perfect and make all the right choices. And I just, I love that this film Mm -hmm. is showing all that and, you know, kind of exploring all that. And I just, I, I love that. So yeah, I found this a a really fascinating film with a really great performance at its core. Yeah. And I, I, uh, forgive me if I'm misremembering, but I thought I remember a moment kind of like at the end, there's like kind of like a press conference kind of thing where she, 
takes some responsibility in that moment. Yes. Too. Yes. Like, she even does. In front of people says like, I'm, this is horrible, but I like also as a mother, like I got to I, some of this is on me. Yeah. Yeah. She says, and we I need- think that's interesting that they decided to show that and that that was part of the, the narrative. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah. Cause she's talking about accountability and how, it, it, yeah. And how she, it's going to start with her and right. And I'm like, and I'm, cause it got, it got me thinking like, is it on her? And like, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but it, it is, you know, it is really interesting. And I wonder if, you know, the real life Mary did that or if that was added, I'm not sure, but it is an interesting, it is an interesting statement to kind of make it an interesting choice, but yeah, very thought provoking. Mm hmm. And uh, it's funny, too, because I watched this movie after the other movie we're about to talk about, Blow the Man Down, and inadvertently ended up doing a double feature of movies that involve (laughs) death of a sex worker. (laughs) You know, it's Uh so speaking of that, it's so funny because I watched four films today and uh, I watched another film that was about a sex worker. And then I watched another film that is about death and a cover up. So. So all four films are about death, cover-ups, oh, and sex workers. <laughs> Inter- yeah. Interesting themes. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, why don't we talk about the the, the other film we're going to talk about today, Blow the Man Down. Yay! Hey, <laughs> blow is. the man down. I knew there was going to be a <laughs> musical interlude. Thank you, Dave, for not letting me down. You're welcome. <laughs> um, this film's coming out on Amazon, so you'll be able to see it this week. It's coming out on uh, Amazon Prime, I believe. Yes. I'm not sure if you have to pay to rent initially, but it will be on Amazon to watch. I loved this movie. Oh! <laughs> Evan, I can no longer be your friend or colleague. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> Shots have I been mean, fired. For me, it started with Dave's uh, singing. No, um, the, the singing <laughs> in the movie, I thought was just... I love it. I mean, it's just like you have this very New England kind of crime noirish drama uh, that has just this like totally weird decision that I love to include singing <laughs> semen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I loved the sea shanty singing. That was probably oh, the best yeah. part of the film. Yeah. Um, and I w- I'll talk about it later, but I, I think it comes back around in a really interesting way. Well, I guess I didn't know how fucked up the lyrics to Blow the Man Down were before I saw this movie. But um, it's not that I think it was bad. I mean, at least the guys could sing. But um, it just seemed like... What am I trying to say without offending anybody? Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> think about it, and I'll I'll just offer a very brief plot summary. Go ahead. Just to... <laughs> so this is a film about a... a uh, sisters Mary Beth and Priscilla Connolly um, and <laughs> they attempt to cover up a gruesome run-in with a dangerous man and to conceal their crime they must go deep into the criminal underbelly of their hometown Easter Cove Maine which is not a real place no I looked it up <laughs> but it was filmed in Harpswell Maine yeah no it was filmed in Maine but <laughs> Interesting how none of the characters had Maine accents, but they did have Massachusetts accents. But so. yes. some Maine accents kind of do overlap with a... Y- y- if you're farther south, e. yeah. yeah. You get farther well, in away from the water and further north, then, then you get a lot of the, you know, the that kind of talking up there. So, I mean, I, I have heard of, an, of a linguistic trend, though, that like... The closer you are to Boston, the less likely, you, like, or the the less of an accent that you might have compared to some people who are actually further away from Boston and feel like they need an accent to like help kind of like define themselves, which is really weird. Oh, that um, is interesting because I've yeah. actually read linguistically in Maine something different that there. I mean, yes, there's kind of an overarching accent, if you will, but there are also so many. Uh, regional variations and like if you're on an island it's different than if you're inland is different if you're uh, you know down east is different if you're you know so that's so fascinating that we're reading all this about main linguistics and accents i love it i i have an accent story that i'm going to break in with Woohoo! this is about henry big surprise <laughs> so henry and i were talking today and he was talking about a room but he pronounced it rum because he is from here 
So Aww. that is, and I was, I said to him, Henry, it's, it's pronounced rum. He's like, no, it's rum. <laughs> I said, I was like, no, rum is a drink. And then of course he's like, what kind of drink? And I'm like, God, no, I fucking open Abort, the, abort. <laughs> yeah. It's got dirt in the it. the floodgates on that dirt. shit. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to debate that as he gets older, I guess. I don't, I don't really have an accent to speak of except through my nose, so. <laughs> Although it is interesting because no one ever thinks they have an accent, you know. But anyway, um, blow the man down. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now that we took Dave, a little linguistics you, detour. <laughs> have you come around to figure out how you want to phrase your critique? No, I'm going to keep it to myself. Oh, I want to know. <laughs> Maybe off mic, you'll say. Yeah. No, probably not. Oh, so. okay. But um, but wait, I have something to say about the linguistics just before we move on to something else. I will say that the reason why I've thought so much about this is that when when accents are accurate, they feel very seamless. And when accents are not, it takes me completely out of the film and it's very jarring to me. And that was the case throughout a lot of the film for me here. Yeah. Yeah. Also considering now I know this can happen in families, but the sisters had different accents. So. You know, one kind of had one and one kind of didn't. So um, that was a little strange. Yeah. And I'm kind of okay with that because like I'd rather somebody speak, you know, naturally rather than force a bad or fake accent. But at the same time, like then just explain it in the film, like be like, oh, so-and-so, you know, went away to school or I don't know, something like yeah. that. This one went to boarding school and yeah. this one stayed and <laughs> it was a fishmonger. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um yeah, the the run in that the sisters have with a dangerous man is that one of them kills him. Um, yes, for you in know, self defense. not not entirely unwarranted. Um, yeah, he's a douchebag. Well, I was thinking about did she have to kill him, and then I thought, well, you know, if she hadn't, he probably, you know, if she if he if she just wounded him or, you know, something else, he probably would have killed her. So, yeah, or uh, raped her. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, well, it was certainly going in that direction. Oh, um, yeah. He may have ended up killing her, too, because if you remember when they open his, when he opens his trunk, it's full of purses and blood and hair. Yes. So Right, because he had killed the, the, the main, the pro, sorry, the sex worker that is missing slash dead in the film. He's the one who murdered her. <laughs> mm, it may be. Um, What's her name? Edith. I mean, Edith yeah. might have killed her, and he might have just gotten rid of the body. Exactly. Oh, uh, that's true. That's true. He. I mean, he. There's that part where he's. They get out of his car, and she. He's chasing her through the snow, trying to get her, and then he tackles her. And uh, Margot Martindale, who plays Enid, is watching from the window and doing nothing. Yep. Yeah. So, that's true. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so the sisters have a dead mother whose funeral they are completing, uh, you know, with the, everybody coming over. And then there's these three women who are like, oh, your mom was the greatest, blah, blah. What a true friend. <laughs> um, and it's Annette O'Toole and June Squibb and somebody else. Um, Annette O'Toole, who's been playing a lot of roles like this lately, but, um, you know, why not? Um, and then you find out that Margot Martindale and the three women and... Colleen and uh, what's what's the other one's name? Um, their mother. The yeah, the Colleen I think was the mother. Mary Beth and Priscilla. Oh, Mary Beth and Priscilla. You're right. Colleen was mom. Uh, you find out that the mom, the three women, and Margot Martindale had decided many many moons ago to open a brothel because they didn't have any money and they were broke and they were like, we got to fucking make money. So they did that. Mm -hmm. and but they also did it because they felt like at least they could control the the narrative at least with regard to the women in the town like yeah if they have sex workers and they're paying them and, and then that that's happening then those men those like seedy gross men aren't going after like their own daughters and families you know yeah which you know i guess you got to have a reason for everything so um this is i don't know i, I would call that moral gray area Nothing wrong a choice with that. that. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, a choice that probably none of us have, will ever be confronted with. So, you know, how could one judge? So, um, anyway, yeah. Margaret Martindale is kind of the, uh, would we call her the badass of the group? What would we call her? 
the take the fucking no nonsense member of the group. I'm not sure. Um, take no nonsense. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. She's pretty ruthless. And then you have the other three who are kind of like begrudgingly involved. You know, it's like they're partners in the business, but they're like, this is icky. Um, <laughs> or it, it has become ickier. Uh, and then you have dead Colleen who always, I guess, threw her weight behind Enid, and now she can't do that anymore. So they can really just be like, all right, we're closing the brothel down, which is a subplot to go along with this murder plot, which is that uh, Mary Beth murders this fucking psycho, um, and then she goes home, and the other sister is like, all right, we'll call the police. No, we won't. We'll cut him up, and we'll put him in a box, and we'll throw him in the water. And so that's what they do. And by box, we mean cooler. <laughs> we Cooler that they duct tape shut. Um, which, you know, all right. Uh, they don't weigh it down. So... Um, they do. They have an anchor on top of it when they throw it in the Oh, water. do they? Oh, yeah. okay. So yeah, how does it wash up under it. the pier then? Hmm. Good question. Mm. Good question I mean, indeed. must not have weighed it down enough. Yeah, I guess not. The, the sisters are thinking that they're probably going to get away with it until uh, the good sister, let's call her. I don't know. I can't remember the sister's name. Priscilla? Priscilla, thank you. Is well, they Priscilla? call her, some of them call her Priscilla and some of them call her Scylla. And I'm like, what's her fucking name? <laughs> I didn't know um, her name at all throughout the film. So there's that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Scylla leaves her knife there. Mary Beth goes back to find it, doesn't find it, but finds $50,000 buried under the floorboards, uh, which the dead yeah. guy had stolen. Um, but now. Mary Beth takes it and she puts it in the house and, you know, like a dope, she starts using $100 bills to buy things around town. Um, <laughs> clearly, she's never, you know, seen a crime movie before or Goodfellas. Um, but, you know, it's a small town, so maybe, you know, maybe they didn't have a blockbuster growing up. Uh, and so things just get more complicated and <laughs> Margot Martindale figures out they've stolen her money and she's like, I found the knife, which she did. So, which has, by the way, the knife has the name of the family business on the side of it, which clearly you can tell that Scylla, it's her first time dismembering someone. <laughs> um, so Margaret Martindale says, give me back my money and I'll give you the knife. And then the, the sisters are like, all right, we'll do that. And they go to give Margaret Martindale the money. And she's like, I'm going to keep the knife. Here's some money. And you guys will come work for me. And then there's a showdown. And, uh. But not before the other three women are like, fuck you, Margot Martindale. We're closing the business. We're telling the police everything. <laughs> so. Right. And then one of the other sex workers who's uh, sad that her friend has been murdered decides to smother <laughs> Margot Martindale. In her With the sleep. world's smallest pillow. That is a small pillow. <laughs> but then she takes the she money and the hits the road done. with another friend. And um, the sisters get away with it, sort of. I mean, they don't. Yeah. Well, they because, do, well, that's, that's... but... <laughs> they're... Well, here's... He, yeah, here's the thing. The three other women who are, you know, the former sex worker under, you know, writers. I don't know <laughs> under, <laughs> what you sex would call them. Sex worker madams? <laughs> yeah. They, they find the body that the sisters have done away with in a very, this is where the, the whole thing with the singing kind of got a little bit strange to me because you've got this rather naturalistic narrative with this singing interludes. I won't call them weird cause they're not weird. It's just, you know, it's, it's not my choice. Um, I don't even mind that you want to have a fucking Greek chorus or in this chorus, you know, a bunch of Irish seamen singing like who gives a shit. It's just, the blending of the two at the end when the, like the singing kind of comes in and, you know, you got one woman, you know, hosing down the cooler, which by the way, it looks like it's below freezing. So I don't know how that's going to work. You got another one, like taking out the trash. You got another one, like carrying some shit and it's like, what's going on here? And then the sisters are like, Oh no, you know, blow the man <laughs> down the end. Yeah. See, that's what I, I so I love that. And at, this is the point I was, finally coming back around to so i love that it's the the singing men throughout the film and then towards the end the guy finishes the song and kind of looks at the camera knowingly you know drinking his beer and then the end when the sisters are kind of like walking through town and they're seeing the, you know the the women 
uh it's the women that are now singing and they're kind of like rising i've to me i kind of took it as like they're kind of like rising to power slash like kind of coming into their own now and it's like the women are singing and yeah then there's this great moment where june squib is rinsing out the cooler and the sisters lock eyes with her while she's doing it and that's just kind of like that's the end of the film and i love that there's just like oh my god she found the cooler but <laughs> clearly doesn't care but oh my god she knows we did this <laughs> Evan, I love that your your interpretation of that, that you're talking about how it's the women coming into power. And I, I just I think that's fantastic um, because it, it's true. Well, that's the great. whole narrative, though, yeah. right? I mean, they're in power all along. Well, they are, but not not them specifically. I mean, this is a movie about women. It's not. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, yeah, women are at the center throughout the whole thing. But no, but what I what I love about that, about the about the power and kind of the declaration of power is that. The directors, um, they said in an interview that the reason that they first started off when they when they wrote the film, they just had the two sisters at the core of the story. And then they made this an ensemble and they added older women and they specifically added older women because they're considered to be underestimated women. And I just I kind of love that note. And and it's very true. And I kind of love this notion of these ruthless older women who are very powerful, but people don't assume them to be so. And, you know, and here they are, you know, kind of, you know, the sea shanties are, you know, maritime labor songs and historically. And then these women are singing them as if, you know, they're the ones who are working and they're the ones who have, you know, been working all along. But here they are, you know, coming into their own you know, vocally and thematically. And I just, I love that. Yeah, me too. I I dug the heck out of that. Like, I just thought that was such an awesome way to kind of bring the singing back around and to just like make this really great kind of ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Well, speaking about the, the kind of themes of the sea, I also love that the, the mermaid icon, like the mermaid symbol, like that they use, on that's on the cooler that's also on the door to their um Mm -hmm. to their fish shop that's also on like the there's a mermaid door knocker on the brothel house it's also on the poster of the film i love that especially because not only does it tie you know not only is it a nautical theme of course because you know this is a seaside town but i also love that historically you know or you know, mythologically, historically, mermaids, sure, they were beautiful and, you know, seductive and all that, but they also were often harbingers of doom and, you know, disaster. And I kind of love that this is strewn throughout, you know, the film, you know, the ocean and the mermaids. And I just, I love that. Right. It's like they, you know, they, oh, look, the the men, they've captured their attention. and Now they (laughs) drag them to the depths of their death. Yes. It's great. I love it. Um, but the door, the door knocker, that cracks me up because there is the moment. I think it's the younger cop who they describe as a good Catholic boy. He goes to use the yes! knocker and he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't touch the mermaid's boobs. Yes. He, he feels weird about it. He has like a moment of hesitation and then grabs like the tail part of the knocker. Yeah. That's also interesting too. thinking of, with, I love that scene, but it's also interesting thinking about that because like he has a crush on, you know, the sis, the younger sister, like the whole film. And then he starts starts to realize like what has happened like in that like he finds out first that she likes like asshole guys that she's interested in asshole guys and then his friend tells him that you know she was hanging around you know the guy um i can't think of his name and i have it uh gorsky gorsky thank you and she was hanging around quick quick correction i yes he's into scylla not into mary beth Oh, thank you. Sorry. I couldn't remember. I I appreciate that, Dave. (laughs) But yes, the older sister. So um, he's the older sister and, you know, he finds out that the younger sister, you know, was hanging around, you know, Gorski. And then towards the end of the and so he's kind of suspicious, you know, of them. And then at the end of the film, you know, the the older, you know, cop says to him like, oh, there's your girl. Let's go say hi. And he's like, I'm not interested anymore. And it's so interesting that like now that there's kind of like a dark, shady, you know, past like, nope, he wants wants no part of it is, you know, and part of me was like kind of like, oh, that's interesting, you know, that that he's living by this moral code. But then part of me was also like, oh, he doesn't want a complicated woman. Like, it's just I don't know, it's kind of kind of interesting. Well, I, I think it's well, a little yeah. different from that in the sense that he knows that they killed him. So that's a little different from just being complicated. Well, they don't. He doesn't know that they killed him. Oh, I mean. Does he? 
I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, it it is played as if he is, you know, a little bit smarter than the other cop. <laughs> uh, maybe well, not much. And more willing. Yeah. And more willing to see through or or less willing to put up with the the moral gray area that you were referencing earlier like the 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 cop is like well margot martindale is doing bad stuff but like yeah i don't know she was hot back in the day that's like basically what he says <laughs> yeah, he does and it, and he's like i don't know whatever she flirts with me so i'll look the other way essentially <laughs> and it's like this younger cop justin is like mm, that's kind of fucked up <laughs> like maybe we should be taking this murder investigation seriously and looking at suspects and doing investigation yeah no i want to be very clear i'm not saying that the cops should be interested in, in, in any of the women in this film i'm just saying it's, it kind of feels that way thematically um i do have to say that so i love the sea shanties and i love i do love the end of the like the very end of the film but the rest of the film i was kind of meh about and i'm really sad to say that because i was yeah, because like talking about it and thinking about it on a symbolic and thematic level, I think it's great. Uh, you know, like the idea is great, but somehow the execution just, yeah, most of it didn't work for me. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Hmm. 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 <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I thought it was a little slow. I think that would be my complaint about it. But I, I really like these kind of like gritty small time kind of like crime movies like there's something to me that's just satisfying about seeing like a local i don't know like gang or like just seedy activity happening in like small town usa where yeah. it's like someone looks you know at, at it and they're like oh it's a small town and it's so wholesome but there's just like totally like all kinds of like nefarious things happening uh the, <laughs> the outsider wouldn't know but the insider does like like at the end when it's like the younger sister is decided okay she's gonna leave and she's gonna go to college like she planned but the older sister realizes that she wants to stay mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's kind of like she kind of with a grin says like you know what i'm gonna stay I, I'm I, I like it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I like that, too. And I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of gritty films, whether they're about crime or something else. Yeah. And that's the thing, like on paper, like I feel like there's so many things that work so well for the film. But I, like, again, somehow and I don't know, it could be that I'm not a fan of some of the actors in this film. That could be a huge reason why Ooh. it didn't connect with me. Um yeah, and I kind of, I mean, and, and not that this is always necessary because there there are some films that are completely stripped down and very bare and you don't know anything about the characters. But for, but, but for this film, I feel like I wanted more character development. I wanted to know more about the characters. If you're going to have kind of a suspenseful film that's like part of it, kind of a mystery, like I want it, I just want to know more. I want, and I don't know, it just, somehow it didn't, yeah, it didn't connect for me. But like I said, it could be because some of the actors I'm not a fan. Yeah, to me, this kind of, I don't know where I'm getting this necessarily, but it kind of reminded me of In the Bedroom, but crummier, you know? Oh, I, know. I think it's better than In the Bedroom. No, not In the Bed. What I mean is small town murder, mm -hmm. covering up, yep. you know, like what's going on beneath the grass <laughs> with the ants, <laughs> no, David no, no. Lynch. <laughs> No, I agree with you. I'm just saying I think this is a better film than that. So Yeah. Well, I haven't seen In the Bedroom in a long time, but I, I do remember uh, being absolutely horrified by the um, uh, the murder and the fact that he just gets away with it. No big deal. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's kind of what sticks with me about that. Sure. Um, but yeah this i i don't know that the, when you have low budget movies that are um you know low budget obviously low budget like this is one of the things that always kind of drives me nuts is whether your sound design is good because you can always tell when people are making a low budget movie but they also don't know what they're doing um so these people actually had a pretty good sound design so I, i'm thinking all right i'll give them a few points for that they know what they're doing but still there was something about what would you call it? The, what was the overview? The overlook? What did they call the, the you know, the house? Ocean view. The ocean view. 
I just didn't really think that that was all the 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 thing between the four older women was all that compelling. It's just kind of like, well, just fucking kill, you know, get rid of her, Jesus. <laughs> you know, fucking sitting out there like threatening her, and we're gonna go. There's three of you. There's one of her. Fucking do it, Jesus. You know. So. Well, I think that's the thing is like by the end, you you learn or you realize like yes, these women are all completely ruthless. Like you think it's just gonna be Margot Martindale, but no, they're all ruthless. And so it is yeah. weird, like why they wouldn't have taken you know action sooner um but yeah like i the thing i did love about this is that i love i mean i obviously i love that it centers women and i love in particular it centers older women like i think that's really great but i just wanted yeah i wanted more compelling characters and i just wanted more reason as to why yeah why are they not getting rid of her sooner like it just it didn't make sense i mean they even talk about it and they even say that you know because of the you know the mother's death the sister's mother's death their friend there's no reason to not go after her now like so yeah it yeah. just agree mm-hmm. but i do love that the women are are ruthless and villainous in this i always appreciate that so there's a definitely yeah, for me, a, it is. And so for me, there's definitely a lot to like here and, and a lot of things that work and yeah. And some things I, yeah, wish I connected more. So, but what are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> you, I'll tell you what you're going to do. Blow the man down. <laughs> <laughs> Blow the man down. Yeah. But you know, Dave, when you were saying like, it's not weird, it's just not a choice you would make to have those sea shanties. I think it is weird. And I, I actually really love that. I love that it has that weird element to it. I don't think that it's particularly weird. Um, oh, you don't? Interesting. No. Um, is it not I weird think enough? I think it's kind of pedestrian, frankly. <gasps> so. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Maybe that's that's the best way I can put it without... Sounding like an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> All righty then. Joan was watching it with me at the beginning, and then she had to go work a little bit. But she says to me, like thirty seconds in, she's like, "Is this a fucking musical?" <laughs> I was like, I, "I hope not, because it's a fucking murder story." So, yeah, I, I want um, a musical murder story. That's amazing. <laughs> well, isn't that Sweeney Todd? I mean, yes, there you go. it is Sweeney Todd. So any spray, I, I, you know, so that's where I come down. I mean, it's, you know, two, two stars, you know, fine. I would rank it higher. Than oh, that, I know obviously. you'd, you'd give it the, the three and a half star treatment. <laughs> I love that you loved it, Evan. I do. I was not, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but I was just like, all right, I totally dig this movie. I'm all about it. <laughs> okay. That's cool. I mean, you're allowed to be wrong once in a while. Oh, <laughs> hey. Hey. <laughs> I see how it is. Yeah. Um so to recap, I would say C blow the man down. Sounds like you guys are a little more mixed on it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean I I always love supporting small films, particularly women written and directed films and women centric films. So I would say, see it for that. And if you like a good sea shanty, um, yeah, like I said, I think there's some things that work and some things that could have been tighter, could have, you know, needed a little more work on, but yeah, it's, it's not. Yeah. Not I'm, I'm on, <laughs> I'm on board with that, that sentiment. Absolutely. Cool. And we would say see Lost Girls, right, Megan? Yes, I would say see Lost Girls. I mean, if for no other reason, Amy Ryan is amazing in the film. She's so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And also, I, w I want to add one thing we off we often talk about. Frustrating when movies are long. Both of these movies, I think, are like straight up an hour and a half. Hour and a half, so yes. Like, <laughs> in and out. I love yeah. it. <laughs> So, yes. Yeah. So, also a plus in both columns. And both are women directed, <laughs> which I love. Yes, and that is awesome. Mm -hmm. And both about sex workers. Dead sex workers. Well, that's not good. No. That's actually terrible. <laughs> yeah, the dead part, not, not so much. I know, I know. Well, that's why you guys should see Jezebel, because that's about a sex worker, too. And it's a really great um, depiction of sex work. But anyway. Right. <laughs> we'll talk about that another time, maybe. Well, yeah, but maybe we can talk about it next week, since we're going to continue yes. uh, covering streaming films. So. That'd be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, uh, coming in a little shorter than, than normal, but I would say uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. 
Um, we hope that you are all staying safe and healthy. And um, yeah, just thanks as usual for tuning in. Um, you can find the show in tons of places. Uh, you can find it anywhere you get podcasts. We can find it at our website, which is spoilerpiece.com. Um, if you like the show, we would very greatly appreciate it if you rate and review it on whatever platform you listen to. Uh, you can just go to ratethispodcast.com and slash spoiler piece, and that will take you to wherever it is you want to rate us. Um, what else? Um, there are a number of ways you can get in touch with us. We are on Facebook. We're Spoiler Piece Theater. We're on Twitter and Instagram as at Spoiler Piece. And uh, you can email us, spoilerpiece at gmail.com, and you can give us a call. At 86221Piece. And you can leave us a message and, uh, yeah, tell, tell us what you think about these films. And uh, we'd love to hear what you think. You have no excuse. You're quarantined. <laughs> I know. Yeah, there's no excuse not to call the hotline. Call the <laughs> hotline. Fact, it might be... Leave us an email. Yes. Talk to us on yeah. Twitter. All those Talk things. Talk to us. Yeah. It'll, it's good for your mental health. Um, I know times are tough, but if you really like the show and you've got a couple bucks to spare, uh, please also sign up for our Patreon, which you can find at patreon.com slash spoiler piece. And uh, for as low as five bucks a month. You can sign up to get exclusive audio, like this week's audio, where we talk about a myriad of subjects, <laughs> but mainly choose your own adventure books. Uh, you can vote in polls. You can, uh, If you're at the $10 tier, you can pick movies for us to watch. And at some point, we may uh, tweak the tiers, but that's what we have for now. Um, and if you sign up, we'll greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, so my name's Evan Crean. I'm editor for The Independent. I am co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. And you can follow me on Twitter and on Letterboxd as Real Recon. And my name is Dave Riedel. I write for Salt Lake City Weekly. You can follow me on all the tweets and the Instagrams and the Letterboxds as Dave Sees Movies. And my name is Megan Kearns. I'm a freelance film critic, editor of Bitchflix, and a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. And you can follow me on Twitter at OpinionS World and on Instagram at the OpinionS. Stay safe, everyone. We'll st- yep. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.